is can be 3D printed? Which one of these, where can I find the um, use cases where 3D printing uh, could make um, sense and could be an um, economic um, alternative to the conventional design? So there is one first uh, question, um, where to get these um, 3D printing use cases? Um, in the AM software, then it's, yeah, we just uh, roughly sketched. Um, so it consists of the quality check, um, like repairing, repairing the models, positioning, nesting, and um, optimizing the, the build. Um, so in the first um, part where um, we want to find use cases for 3D printing, this is where the 3D Pathfinder comes in to be able to scan a whole database of millions of parts and then to apply um, specific filters to be able to find applications for 3D printing. And the next step in the pre-processing is where 4D Additive um, comes, um, comes in. So um, this is to pre-process the files to then be able to, to send um, native CAD files to the printer. And this is all based on the exact representation of the parts. Um, yeah. So 3D Pathfinder and 4D Editor really enables um, a workflow uh, which is consistent um, yeah, to be able to integrate into the AM process. Yeah, one of the items that I should mention on here is when he talks about exact geometry or VREP, it's like a step file or the actual native file itself. So when we did a research on what is the gap in the industry when we built this technology, we said, okay, one of the gaps was that metal printing um, is requires a boundary representation. Also, we, you cannot heal a tessellated model or STL file. So there was a lot of things that you'll see in the technology today, because we'll show you can the, the demonstration of the product itself, is why we focused on using the boundary representation that added both in a pre-process side as well as a prop, um, uh, printing side as well. So the batch, keep in mind, one of the other things that we found after we started using the 3D uh, added or 4D additive printing technology, folks were also asking for a batch process, right? So if you think of small cutting, cookie cutters as an example, you have an entire batch being printed, it gets moved off and you need to queue up those jobs so that you continue printing without having to have a user interact with that. So we built that as well. So it's modular based is the technology. Um, and I have a paper also that you'll be able, you'll get a copy of after you've uh, attended this webinar as well. So price uh, B rub geometry is, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And I'll go through this quickly because a lot of this is gonna be shown in the actual presentation itself. I'll touch more directly on things that will not be covered in, in Laurent's presentation. But from the healing capabilities, a lot of people talk about healing and stitching, free edges or imprecision of the model. Core technology actually added from our software 3D evolution of 10 years of advanced healing capabilities. We added the VDA, which is German Automotive, and the Sussex advanced healing capabilities on the actual model itself. And this was a big gap in the industry of being able to correct things. Surface quality is another thing you'll see today, so I'll skip over that. And then more importantly, mass zones or wall thickness, right? Maybe it has to have a certain thickness. Maybe you want to change the thickness because you're just doing a prototype. If you're doing a prototype, you don't need it to be as precise. So if you're using polymers versus printing actual production data, you may change uh, change your position on that. Right. And then advanced cutting of large models. So also available as an analysis tool is our collision detection within the model and also draft analysis. So those two things will, might not be shown today. So you wanna know where parts will collide when you printed it and you also wanna make sure that the correct angle that identify the angle change of a positive or negative for draft analysis. We also have the capabilities of changing the model within our software. A lot of customers were asking, okay, well, this specific part, I, I have to scale it, or I may want to change a specific hole for different functions of the actual part. So we have direct modeling. And then hollow and LASIK structures, which you'll see today. 
And then the last and important one that seems to be a very high demand is a lot of the technology from a competitive standpoint does not include the texturing. So it's something that's kind of uh, needed in the industry. And you can see you can have hundreds of thousands of different texturing available that we import. And we'll show you that today. And then also to, the, to support your generation of either metal or plastic to ensure that you have the proper stru uh, support structure in the model itself. And then hatching and slicing, of course, is, is a big one. Keep in mind, he's going to show you how you can flip from, because once you start creating multiple parts of a boundary representation or a step file, if you want to call it, you're going to notice that your files are going to get really big. So we have the capabilities of moving back and forth from a tessellated model, also from a VREP, which is very unique to core technology as well. And of course, nesting is always extremely important because this way it's downtime on your printer in this space. And then that is kind of a overview of the process that you'll see today. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Laurent. Okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen now. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to do a um, quick uh, live demo to um, give an overview of what 4D edit Additive is capable of. Um, at first, what um, you would do is um, set up the, the printer you want to use or the, the printing technology you want to use. There we have um, a database consisting of uh, lots of different um, uh, manufacturers, um, technologies, so you can filter um, the different um, technologies or also uh, materials to, um, to set up uh, the printer you're using um, on your shop floor. Uh, you have also the possibility to just um, adapt uh, the parameters or even create your own uh, 3D printer. So you can set up um, really all the parameters, you can change them um, and um, yeah, integrate your own 3D printer in, in, inside the database. I'm just going to select one because we also use it um, in-house. So as um, David has already uh, mentioned, um, the big advantage of um, core technology um, in 4D Additive is that our geometry kernel can read uh, native CAD files. So what we can, um, I will open a file right now um, to show you um, the graphical user interface. And this file here, for example, is a CATIA file. So you're really able to um, load and read direct um, native um, VREP files. Okay. So um, I read now this um, CATIA file and you see the um, user interface just uh, changed a bit. What appears now is um, a workshop bar, which is here in, at, the, at the top. So the um, 4D additive is um, organized in different modules. So you have different uh, workshops which follow um, the workflow of the um, pre-process. Um, and on the right side, we have all the functions according to the workshop. So um, I will start with the first workshop, which is the healing workshop. So the first step would be to make sure that the part um, we, are, we want to print is watertight so that there are no any um, geometrical errors that could lead to a failure of uh, the print. Um, and like David uh, has already mentioned, um, the, the checks, the geometry checks we do um, in this um, sections are um, certified by the um, German Automotive Association. So um, we have a um, lot of experience in, in healing um, geometrical errors. Um, so yeah, we can um, work directly on, on native um, CAD files and um, make sure that they are um, printable. Uh, I won't go too much into detail uh, what the algorithms um, do. Um, just keep in mind that 
you can directly read in native CAD files and, um, and process them for um, the next next steps. So. I will go through to um, after having corrected all the geometrical errors as soon as the part um, is correct to, to be printed. The next step would be um, to check with different analysis tools if the part was correctly designed for 3D printing and especially for the technology we want to use. Um, so one really important one is the wall thickness check. I'm just going to check the file. So we see here um, in different colors um, and a scale on the left side, the different wall thicknesses of, of the model. We can click on the, on the model and see um, the local wall thickness um, at uh, the different areas and also, for example, filter it if you only want to see um, specific uh, wall thicknesses and certain values that are critical for the technology we want to use. Um, so we can really filter at, at this stage and see if there are any areas that could be um, critical or, or cause problems um, in, the, in the printing process. Um, later, I will show you, we can also adapt it. So we, we have um, direct modeling uh, functions to also be able to thicken a part in, at certain areas, do an offset, um, so also adapt and, and modify the geometry. Um, another strong tool is uh, massive zone detection. Uh, this is similar to wall thickness, but in this case, um, we will search for areas that have a lot of material density, so um, areas where there is really um, um, a lot of material that has to be fused together. This can cause problems um, for different technologies, for example, um, temperature um, problems inside the, uh, the machine and can, can lead to warping, distortion of the parts or even affect the parts that are placed um, close to, to, to the parts where we have um, big uh, massive zones. Here also we can um, interactively uh, just uh, click on the surface and see how far um, the center of this uh, massive zone, um, how big the distance is to the, to the outer surface of the, of the part. Um, so these are um, two um, really um, important analysis to, to find out if the part has been correctly designed. Afterwards, we then have the um, possibility to adapt uh, the file. For example, right now we've just detected, okay, we have um, a lot of material in certain areas that uh, has to be fused together. So why not hollow the part? So I'm going to show you the hollowing function, which is included in 4D Additive. We can set up the thickness of the part itself at the, at the outer um, surface. And then there's also the possibility to integrate lattice structures. So for example, yeah, um, different um, lattice structures, I will choose the honeycomb structure um, for this specific case and then uh, run the function. And then I will show you the, the result of it. And, and right now, uh, Laurent, are you using a B-Rep geometry on this, or a solid model, or are you using uh, the tessellation? In this case, um, for the ladder structures, we have to change into um, tessellation um, mm -hmm. representation of the model. So what we do in our kernel is we always keep the um, native representation, so the B-Rep representation of the part. And uh, I'm going to show you, we can always switch between these two representations. So in the background, um, at the same time, we create a tessellation of the part. And for some functions like the hollowing and creating letter structures, but also what I will later show you is the, 
the texturing. Um, the textures also um, are integrated into tessellation. They are translated into um, tessellation because this would be way too complex to create um, a B-Rep based on a, on a texture, which is uh, impossible. So at some um, points, we have to change into a tessellated uh, representation, but we always keep both representations um, inside uh, our software. So I can always change to the, uh, the exact representation and continue to work on, on the B-Rep. So now I've just created um, a hollow and inside a letter structure, but I can switch back to the B-Rep representation and then continue with my orientation of the part with my positioning inside the machine and still have the advantages of a really lightweight model, which is a B-Rep model. I, I, hear, I see a question come up if I can just add to it right now. I think it might be a good idea. In this, yep. this availability for both the B-Rep, the question is, is, is the availability available for all CAD formats that you're reading for both tessellated and uh, tessellated when you read it into your technology? Yes, we can also oh. follow um, SDL files, for example. So you can read um, tessellated formats, not only B-Rep, we can read both of them. We can also um, check um, tessellated models, repair them. And of course, if you want to create hollow and um, letter structures, you can also do that on um, tessellated files, of course. Thank you. Yeah, so what I'm just uh, quickly um, going to show is the result of this I'm going to cut through this model here. So as we see here, I'm now in the B-Rep representation. We just see the B-Rep as it is um, with no letter structure inside. Now, when I switch to the tessellated representation, this is where I see um, the result of my um, honeycomb structures, which, which we have uh, put inside with the, with the hollowing function. So this is now really, um, way more complex file than, than the B-Rep representation, but we store this information on the tessellated representation. And um, now we can just uh, switch back to the B-Rep and continue uh, to work with, with uh, the B-Rep model, um, which is then really lightweight and, and um, we don't lose in um, performance. Um, okay, so for this um, point, um, here in the um, analysis and modeling tool, like I said, we can, um, for example, create offsets on some faces. If you, for example, want to create an, an offset because you know this part is going to be milled afterwards or you want to um, change the diameter of a hole, you can just um, adapted to your needs. So there are also um, direct modeling tools integrated to, to be capable to, to um, modify um, the geometry to the, to the uh, 3D printing technology. Um, okay, so now I will change to the next workshop, which is then after um, checking the file, if the file is, um, has no geometrical errors, then analyzing it if it's suitable for our um, 3D printing um, technology and um, anal or also modifying the file. Then we come to orienting it inside the machine, so to find the, the right um, printing orientation. Um, this is where um, we integrated some uh, really strong uh, surface quality analysis, uh, which um, are really interesting to find um, the right position of the, of the part inside the machine. Um, therefore, we need, depending on the technology, for example, um, support roughness and, and analysis. So for um, metal printing, for example, or SLA, DLP printing, also for plastics, there are some technologies that require support structures. There, of course, it is um, interesting to see which faces are affected by um, the generation of the, of the support structures. 
So this analysis is helpful to find um, the best orientation to, to see which, um, which faces are affected by the support structures and which not. So you can find um, the right orientation. Okay, so here we see if I turn the part around, we see here in red all the faces under a certain angle. Here we define the angle at 45 degree. So we see all the, the red areas now um, will need support structures in this case. There are also some green areas which will then host support structures to support um, the areas which, uh, which require support. And <clears throat> all the analysis that we do for finding the right orientation are, um, um, are processed in real time. So I can change the um, orientation of my part and immediately I see um, the, the result of um, the orientation I just changed. So this is also a really uh, helpful tool. Um, Another analysis which is um, really specific for 3D printing is the geometric uh, roughness, which is um, the, basically the so-called stair-stepping effect. So this is due to the different layers we have to, uh, which are applied in the 3D printing process. And this, of course, affects the surface quality. So um, faces like um, these here in displayed in red, um, that are now really affected by, by this because they are um, positioned in a really uh, flat angle. So if I want them to be in higher quality, I can just change the angle of my, of my part and then see how the surface quality um, gets better and better. So these are really um, interesting um, real-time analysis to, to find um, the right orientation for um, the part. Okay, the next workshop, um, I won't go um, into every detail here, is the support um, creation. So we have different kinds of supports, um, simple shape support, which uh, will be different um, types of um, single supports. Um, structured support are, um, is for um, metal, metal printing. Uh, which are uh, needed at the contours of, um, of the part. Um, basically, these are like thin walls to, um, to support the part. <clears throat> we can also integrate, um, integrate different uh, coring, uh, for example, um, for, these, for these thin walls. And of course, um, tree support, which is um, really important for metal printing, but also um, stereolithography. Um, I just created a um, simple shape support. So just to see, to show you a result of support um, generation. In this case, um, I just chose uh, yeah, really um, simple shape, which is um, this cross, cross type. I hope um, you can see this on my screen. Um, yeah, this shows a, a result of a um, support generation. I, I know that there's a question coming in at the same time that you showed that. So currently, um, that last part that you showed had no thickness to it. And the question is, is, does the wall thickness checker allow you to do an offset on adding mm -hmm. thickness to the model similar to what's available in other products that you offer, like 3D Evolution? Uh, yeah, of course. We can, uh, based on the wall thickness analysis, um, I have shown uh, we can then uh, create an offset or use the direct modeling tools um, to, to thicken um, areas um, here on, on the path, yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay. Um, now that we have defined the right orientation of the part, we want to fill up um, the machine for the actual uh, printing process. So now I'm going to um, 
load uh, different models here just to have some um, inside the machine. To show you um, the, our, our, our tools for um, duplicating the parts, um, position them inside the machine, and um, more important, the, the 3D nesting tool, which is a um, really strong tool for um, laser centering and um, powder bed fusion technologies. Okay, so now I've um, loaded some, some models. Um, let's assume we have um, defined a specific um, printing orientation of the, of the parts. Um, then in this workshop, which is called placement and nesting, this is where we can now uh, duplicate the parts and position them inside the machine and um, use um, the 3D nesting tool. So I'm going to duplicate um, just roughly some of them. So either we can just uh, drag here these arrows or type in how often um, we need a certain part. Okay, so now I've duplicated all the, um, the models I uh, want to put inside the machine. So now I'm using the PAC algorithm, which is our 3D nesting tool. So there we have um, different kinds of settings. Um, we, can, we can set up uh, where we want to start um, the nesting, um, the different kinds of rotations that are allowed on the, on the parts, um, which here, um, only enable a rotation around the um, z-axis, um, number of rotations which uh, can be translated into um, angles, so four rotations would mean 90 degree. I will um, use the current um, orientation we have just um, set up and define a minimum distance of five millimeters in this case. Um, then we have some some further um, parameters like um, packing strategy, uh, maximum height. If we don't want to fill up the whole machine, I'm just going to um, set up the the voxel size, which is um, uh, where the the algorithm is depending on it. Um, okay, so now I run the function, and as you will see, now the algorithm picks uh, the biggest uh, parts, uh, fills the machine, and then uses the smaller parts to fill up um, the little holes that are remaining so that we get a really high uh, packing density, which is the, uh, the goal in, in most um, cases for these kind of uh, technologies where we can really um, put the parts um, one in, into, into another and really use the whole volume of the machine um, to, save, uh, to save time and, and material. So now we see the algorithm fills the machine with all these, these little remaining models to really get a high um, packing density. What is also integrated into this tool is um, an optimization uh, algorithm. So after the packing, we can also um, um, use the optimization um, algorithm, which actually tries to, um, to minimize the maximum height and even um, try to get an even better, um, better packing density. Uh, which is called the uh, Monte Carlo algorithm, basically just shuffling um, all the models and trying to um, um, to get a, a higher packing packing density. Um, what is also included in this uh, workshop is creating of um, cages. This can uh, also be really helpful for tiny uh, little pieces because after the process. Um, the parts have to be sandblasted 
and um, this is really important for the the better handling of the parts um, to be able um, in, in the sandblasting um, to have um, yeah better handling of, of the little uh, little parts so we can create um, cages um, we can also uh, label the parts so that um, we can um, track track the parts um, after the printing process and see where they um, have been located in, inside the machine. What is also um, included is um, you can add non-manufacturing areas. So you can tell the algorithm um, and define um, certain areas that are uh, prohibited to um, put um, parts inside. If there is, for example, um, um, temperature sensor um, in this in this area, we can um, add a non-manufacturing area in here. Um, what is also really important if the, um, the packing is done manually is a collision detection. So we have our um, algorithm included to um, be able to, to detect them in order to, um, to don't, yeah, to not have a, a failure in, in the print if yeah, some parts are um, uh, were put um, inside in each other. Okay, um, the last uh, workshop which I'm going to show now is the texturing module. So I will open a new part to show you. Um, why, you, why um, as you start pulling up that, we have a question I thought that might be position, interesting. Um, we yeah. noticed that when you set this up on the bed and you chose, it looked like you chose a specific printer. So how many different printers do you, does your technology support? And if it's not supported, um, is it easy to add like drivers or printers to the solution? Um. So the information we take um, at the moment are um, the dimensions of the of the printer, the um, um, height of the the layers, and also um, tessellation parameters um, for the the specific printer. So uh, we have um, quite big uh, database. If um, a specific printer is not uh, included in here, um, so we can. This is what I, I showed at the beginning. We can just add it into the database if we have all the parameters for um, the dimension of the of the build volume um, and um, material properties, for example. So we can we can just integrate it. Um, the user can also um, integrate it himself um, if if he wants uh, to change uh, any parameters. Um, yeah. And basically, every technology is um, is almost every technology is, is supported. So we create um, support structures for uh, metal printing, like SLM or DLMS. Uh, we create support structures for SLA or DLP, um, for powder bed fusion technologies like uh, laser sintering or the HP technology. Um, of course. Um, we have our 3D nesting tool, which is um, really helpful. Um, yeah. So, um, basically, and, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So now I will show the texturing uh, module, which is really. Um, a, a great, uh, great technology because we are um, um, in comparison to um, to other market solutions, we can use the BREP representation. So um, you will see it is really uh, quick and easy to define where to put um, the textures. So first step would be to just choose uh, the different uh, faces where where to apply um, the texture. This is really um, easy easy to use because you either select uh, the different uh, faces or you select only one face and then select the tangent faces to that. So you you get automatically all the faces that are attached to to the first face that you you selected. 
then we generate the um, texture zone. Then we see this uh, little checkerboard to see if the projection of the um, texture went, uh, went well. Therefore, we also, if there are, um, for example, spheres or um, cylindrical faces, we have also a different um, kind of uh, projection to be able to apply textures um, to uh, more complex uh, geometries. Um, after the um, creation of the texture zone, then we switch to our library where we uh, can choose the, um, the texture we want to apply. So therefore, we have integrated because we have a partnership with um, a software called um, Substance, um, which is now part of um, Adobe. They are, are located in the um, video game sector. So there um, you are able to choose out of a really big uh, library over 5,000 um, different textures. I'm just going to show you quickly um, the website. Um, so here you see just um, a small overview there are a lot of different uh, types of uh, materials. For example, if I choose um, metal and all these textures can be implemented into uh, 4D additive. So um, this is a really um, strong combination of uh, two tools. We are able now here to integrate a um, substance um, texture. I will quickly choose one this one, for example, and which is uh, really interesting here is that these are not only an image that is put on the file, it's parametric. So I can change, for example, I can change the resolution of the texture. So now you see um, um, a really high um, resolution of this leather uh, structure. Uh, we can, for example, uh, say, okay, I don't want this double stitch. I just want a single stitch. Um, so this is really um, adaptable to to the um, to your needs. So um, these textures are parametric. A lot of parameters, different parameters. I'm just going to um, apply this texture right here. Then what we do is we can then turn it around, scale it to the part. So this is really uh, quick and easy to use. And then um, the last step would be to translate this rendered image now into um, a, a tessellation because at this step we have to create a tessellation. So I'm just going to set this up. Okay. And recreate the tessellation. Now what you see is the tessellation of uh, the original model without the texture. And now the software is going to regenerate it based on the texture information of the texture we just um, put on. And um, then we generate a 3D printing file, which then can be, can be sent to the printer. Yeah, so that's, that's fantastic. Really, really nice and, and quick way to um, to enhance um, your 3D printing models, um, yeah, not only aesthetically but also put functional textures on the parts. And um, what is also um, really interesting is that um, you don't have to rely on the substance library. You can also use your own textures. Just um, import an image file. You can use your own textures. You can also put text on it to label the parts. So um, there are a lot of um, different um, options to create an individual um, design. And yeah, at the end of the process, what we do is then um, send the file to the 3D printer. Um, so there is one way either to export the tessellation. So we can export um, the, the files in the different um, printing formats like 3MF, AMF, OBJ or STL. Or what we also um, have integrated is our own slicer so we can create our own slicing. And this is also uh, really interesting. We can, um, we can create it 
also on the BREPs, on the native um, CAD files. Um, so we are capable of exporting vector graphics. So um, this is not then an approximation of the tessellated file, but really the contours from the, the native original, original file. Um, of course, now we've just applied textures. So in this case, um, when we apply textures, we then have to generate a tessellated file. Um, but in, um, in a lot of cases, this um, could be uh, really interesting to, to export um, an exact um, slicing, slicing file. And currently we are, we are working in, in projects to um, establish a um, generative build processor to be able to, to directly um, export it to a 3D printer. Okay, so this was um, a yeah, quick overview of the capabilities of um, for the additive. Um, if there are any questions left, feel free to ask them. Yeah, I see a question here that I'd like to ask. One of them you had mentioned earlier about roughness. So you have tools within the software to be able to smooth any kind of roughness after you identified it? Because um, after you print in the metal printing, the problem is, is that it's very hard to, to clean the model right after it's printed. So we'd rather do it pre-process. Yeah. So um, what I showed is in the, um, when we are using these um, analysis to find the right orientation is at the same mm -hmm. time, we can then um, change the orientation in real time and see how the, the surface quality changes. So at this point we can, mm -hmm. We have a direct um, uh, output, a direct feedback of what we what we are changing and how this affects um, the surface quality. But at some areas, of course, there will always remain um, these um, surface quality issues because we have to put, uh, for example, support structures um, somewhere. With this tool, we can um, we can see the first. Um, impression mm -hmm. of how the, the result would be to find the the best orientation and to to adjust at which areas we will have these these surface quality issues very good looks like we have uh, two two one short sweet question here is uh, regarding scaling so are you able to scale the model very easily in this or do I need to do that prior to importing no, we can do it directly in, in 40 Additive. Yeah, I've, I um, haven't shown all the, the functionalities. Um, when, we, when we select a part, we are also able uh, to, to scale it. Oh, yeah. very nice. And can you identify your own scaling or is it just based on what your software does? You can customize? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can very customize. Good. Yeah, there is a, um, you can just, just type in whatever you, you want to scale it. Good. All right, we have one more question here regarding supported colors. We noticed that you can write out to an OBJ and some of the other formats. Do you know if uh, the OBJ color, the question is, do you know if OBJ supports colors? Yes, um, OBJ is a format which uh, supports colors, of course, and we can, um, we will release um, a new version um, during um, May, and there we will be able to um, also export uh, these colors. For example, from the texturing I just showed, it was a red mm -hmm. leather with a black uh, stitch. We will be able to um, export this in, in OBJ, yes. Very good. 